I'm Chris Whitten. I teach classics at Cambridge University. And this is the first of a little set of talks about Germanicus and Piso in Tacitus' Annals. This first talk is about Germanicus himself, but let me first start by just setting the historical scene. Our tale begins in the year AD 18. It's four years into the reign of Tiberius. He's the second emperor of Rome following Augustus. Uh, Augustus was his stepfather and had ad adopted him in AD 4 to be his successor. Now that means just setting the scene more broadly, we're about 60 years since Cicero died, we're towards 40 years since Virgil died, leaving his Aeneid. Um, Ovid himself might just have died in the last year or two, and in terms of world history, probably the most important thing happening at the moment is that a man called Jesus uh, has just reaching adulthood and he is in Judea, which is the next province to the, the province where this is taking place, Syria. Now, back to Tiberius. Um, Tacitus, whose version of this story we're reading, makes the tale of Germanicus and Piso a key moment in his reign. He was emperor from 14 to 37 AD. Uh, and therefore of the early Roman Principate. Uh, and it's worth thinking a little bit about why he does that and what he does with this story. So the first of our two protagonists, as I said already, is Germanicus, in Latin Germanicus, with a long A, um, related to Germania, the Latin for Germany. Um, his death in Antioch, uh, Antioch was the capital of a Roman province called Syria. It's now in Turkey, right at the bottom uh, south southwestern part of Turkey, just before you get to modern Syria. He dies in Antioch in October 19 AD, and that is the centre of our tale. Now, Germanicus is a very important figure in the Roman Principate, but he's not one people tend to hear about so much because he never did become emperor. He was born in 15 BC, and he was the son of Tiberius's younger brother, Drusus, who is known as Drusus the Elder, slightly confusingly, uh, for reasons to appear in a minute. That means he was Tiberius's nephew, but he was also Tiberius's adoptive son. I said a minute ago that Augustus adopted Tiberius to be his successor. When he did that, he also made Tiberius adopt Germanicus. Now, adoption in antiquity is a little bit different from nowadays. In a sense, it's the same in that you make someone a sort of quasi son or daughter of yours. But nowadays, adoption is generally mainly about how you raise a child, giving a child someone to look after them. In ancient Rome, it's primarily about making sure you have someone to take your name and carry your family forward. So if, for instance, you didn't have a son of your own, uh, it might be desirable to adopt one. So Augustus was in exactly that position. Um, as he became an old man, he did not have a living son or even living grandsons. So to make sure he had a successor as emperor, he adopted Tiberius. And to program what happened next, he had Tiberius adopt Germanicus. So he'd sort of fixed two stages of the imperial succession. So at the time of our tale, late teens AD, Germanicus is the heir apparent, like the Prince of Wales in modern Britain. Um, and that starts to explain why he's such an important figure. And in fact, the later history bears this out because Germanicus actually becomes a kind of linchpin of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. That's the first uh, emperors of Rome. His son, Caligula, would become emperor after him and his grandson Nero would be emperor to after Caligula, and he would be the last of the Julio and Claudians. So a key figure, even though he didn't actually become emperor himself. Now, in Tiberius's version, he's also a very romantic figure, not in the sense that he has lots of love affairs, but in the sense that he's a glamorous sort of hero figure. Um, he's introduced as someone who's hugely popular. Tastus writes, he was a young man with remarkable friendliness, and he explicitly opposes that to Tiberius, who is considered very standoffish and unfriendly with other members of the Roman elite. And as you know, if you've read some of this, he gets a very glamorous death. Um, we have a stirring scene of pathos. We have a last speech in which he speaks movingly to his, uh, his wife and his friends and relatives. Now, that's actually a point of fashion in Latin literature at this period. It's known as exitus literature. Exitus is Latin for departure or death. 
and there was a trend for writing the deaths of distinguished people. Um, and we know about that partly from lost works that we hear about and partly from other examples. So, for instance, elsewhere in the Annals, Tacitus has a very grand description of the death of Seneca, Seneca the Younger. And elsewhere um, in contemporary literature, you could have a look at how Pliny the Younger describes the death of his uncle, Pliny the Elder, when Vesuvius erupts. That's in the epistles. And this one, this death of Germanicus, is as heroising as any of them. It leaves him looking like this wonderful, um, tragic victim with whom we're invited to sympathise. Um, he is actually only 33 when he dies, so even by Roman standards, that is still pretty young. In fact, it means he's almost exactly the same age as Alexander the Great, that greatest of Greek generals who died a month before his 33rd birthday. And Tacitus doesn't miss the chance to draw that comparison, saying that at the time of Germanicus' death, people compared him to Alexander. So again, that implies that he is a kind of ultimate general figure, uh, a figure who should go down in myth as a great instance of a fantastic young conqueror. But there's also an invitation there to compare and contrast him with Tiberius, because Alexander, of course, was a king. He was the king of Macedon. He was a, the equivalent of a Roman emperor. So if we're seeing Germanicus compared to the best that Greece ever had to offer in terms of an emperor, then that is another way of suggesting that he was perhaps a better alternative to Tiberius, certainly suggesting that he might have been something quite special had he lived to carry on and be emperor. Now, Tacitus is not unique in this. Um, I've got here Suetonius's Lives of the Caesars, which is a set of biographies of the first 12 emperors, including Julius Caesar, written just a little bit after Tacitus was writing the Annals, which is what we're reading at the moment. Um, Suetonius was about 20 years younger than him. And he starts his life of Caligula, who, as I said before, is the son of Germanicus, with a few pages about Germanicus. And he, he also makes him out to be a total hero. This is what he writes. It is the general opinion that Germanicus possessed all the highest qualities of body and mind to a degree never equaled by anyone. A handsome appearance, unequaled valour, surpassing ability in the oratory and learning of Greece and Rome, unexampled kindliness and a remarkable desire and capacity for winning men's regard and inspiring their affection. You can hear that resonates quite well with what Tacitus says, but Suetonius goes the final mile and says he was unequaled by anyone ever. So this is quite a serious hero figure. Now, not surprising then perhaps that Germanicus plays such a large role in Tacitus' account of Tiberius' reign, at least of the first five years while Germanicus was alive. We hear in the first two books of Tacitus' Annals, which describe the history of Rome starting with the accession of Tiberius. And Germanicus features in two main respects. In the first book, he is in command of the armies in Germany, uh, where he puts down a revolt in the year AD 14. And in the second book, he features in the episode we're looking at, when he goes out east to become commander of the Roman forces in all the eastern provinces, uh, then dies, of course. And then that is the tale um, that, that involves Piso, which is going to be our concern. His role as a military figure is not entirely straightforward in Tasta's account. So far, I've described him as romantic, heroized, glamorous. There are some complications. Not everything he does seems to be absolutely spot on. So, for instance, in Germany, he is responsible for a massacre of rebellious soldiers. And Tacitus describes it as a scene worse than any civil war. So that's a pretty dark moment in his military career. And in another moment in Book 2, which is outside our set text, he goes off to Egypt and, amongst other things, does some sightseeing. And he breaks a series of conventions about how a prince and how a Roman should behave while he's doing that. So it's not quite as simple as saying that Germanicus is this ideal prince, princeps, emperor figure for Tacitus. He's a kind of flawed hero, but that is actually completely uh, in keeping with the way Tacitus writes. It is almost unheard of for him ever to make someone totally perfect as a historical actor. He's a, a historian who sees the flaws in everyone and in every situation. But I think the most important 
element of the Germanicus as romantic figure idea is the fact or the sense that he's got the odds stacked against him. And here it's important to mention another Drusus. Tiberius, as I said, adopted Germanicus. So Germanicus was his heir apparent. But Tiberius also had a son of his own who was called Drusus. And he's known as Drusus the Younger to distinguish him from Tiberius's brother, Drusus the Elder. Now, he was only a tiny bit younger than Germanicus. There might only have been six months in it, which if you think about it, makes them pretty close to being twins. Um, and in any event, a big story of the early years of Tiberius's principate, not least as told by Tacitus, is the power play of who is going to become the next emperor. Will it be Germanicus, as designated by Augustus, or will it be Drusus, Tiberius's own son? And Tacitus makes quite clear that Tiberius favours Drusus. In fact, it will be neither, because Drusus too is going to die an early death in 23 AD. Now, this idea that Tiberius is so hostile to Germanicus is central to the way Tacitus uh, presents Germanicus's whole career and his death, and it's an important underlay to um, the question of whether Piso murdered him, which is going to concern us in a minute. Um, it also makes, it contributes to an effect I already mentioned when I talked about Alexander the Great, the idea that Germanicus is kind of a figure you can compare and contrast with Tiberius. He is a foil, if you like. If Tiberius is the tough, not very pleasant, and by the way, quite old emperor, he's about 60 by now, Germanicus is the popular, glamorous, much loved, younger man. So Tasta sets up this kind of contrast for us to think about throughout the whole story. Again, um, when he dies, it's not just that he's compared to Alexander the Great, but Tastus even says that Eastern monarchs and peoples, they revere him for his combination of being majestic, so prince-like, imperial, but also not showing any arrogance. So he's an approachable kind of popular figure. So all of that is the essential background to the rumours that it might actually not have been accident that Germanicus died, not even simply that Piso had him poisoned, but that Piso was acting on instructions from the palace in Rome. So Germanicus, we have seen, is the man who should have been the third emperor of Rome. He died tragically young and unfulfilled, and many people, including it seems Tacitus, although he never quite says it, suspect that there may be something quite sinister afoot, involving perhaps Tiberius, or perhaps, as we'll see, someone else. So it's no wonder that the rumours about his death spread so fast, and that Tacitus makes such a big deal out of it.